the Australian National University. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what I do when I'm when I'm not discussing international law and uh, and and, uh, and 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 writing about it. So it's it's really an honor. I think it's it's good to be to be having such forums like Afronomics Law Academic Forum. Uh, this, these forums, I think, are very important for the development of international law generally, especially in a continent like ours, where international law has not been of, of, of a bigger focus. And uh, like my friend Harrison, even though sometimes we, we, we go seek this knowledge far away from, from our native countries, I think the only way we are going to make... Um, contributions is, is, is through such forums, because truth be told, and Harrison will tell you, uh, to get a space for writing or, or speaking in predominant international law institutions like Max Planck uh, or, or the University of Geneva, the Graduate Institute is not easy for an African student. And so this is a very important forum for, for, for such things. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I think we'll touch on that also, the, that epistemological exclusion from the South uh, contributors. I think that will come more if we get into a uh, substantive part. We just go straight to uh, uh, where Harrison uh, ended. So just to shoot the first question, maybe to get into the session, as we read Agathe's piece, what's the promise of international law? And is it derivating on that promise? And then we can open up to, to Harrison taking uh, up. And then uh, Marie will now invite uh, John when it, it's time also to for the second shift. Thank you, Harrison. Um, Michael, I don't know whether you are the um, host. I wanted to share some slides that I'd prepared, but I can't do it unless, okay, now I can. I don't know whether you see them now. Yes, we can see them. Okay, so uh, I think we've done the introduction. Uh, I'll just, uh, uh, what we are doing today is we are discussing uh, Professor James Gavi's Grotius lecture, The Promise of International Law from a Third World View. And uh, so I'm going to make the first presentation. If you didn't have an opportunity to read the paper because it's on SSRN or listen to the lecture, I'm going to do a small in intro and then uh, we'll go to some points of discussion that I, th I think uh, are interesting. So uh, the Grosch's lecture uh, that uh, Prof. Gethi gave to in, in 2020 is organized by the American Society of International Law. It has been held for a while now and normally in, uh, uh, happens, uh, the, the, the conference happens every year. Um, and of course, uh, for those who are interested in international law, you might know that uh, Hugo Grotius is normally referred to as um, the father of international law. The, he's a Dutch uh, scholar, uh, maybe, 15, maybe 17th uh, century, thereabout. I might be um, wrong, but this, this lecture series sort of is, is referred, uh, refers to him. Um, so his name is quite uh, uh, one of the founding sort of thinkers of international law. In fact, some of the big moments that normally happen in international law, the same as what we have known as a constitutional moment in, in international law, are sometimes referred to as a, 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 Grotian, a Grotian moment. And, and, and so it's, that is the context uh, from, from which, which uh, the lecture was, was being given. So um, th there are two sort of um, parts to the paper that uh, Professor Gadi wrote. His lecture outline is divided specifically just uh, into two. The first part is on international law, limited geography of places and ideas. And the second part is um, the third world approaches to international law, which is abbreviated as TWIL as a subaltern epistemic location. Uh, you'll see that I will try to focus on the second part more than on the first part, but that's, but that's how the lecture is, um, is divided. So let me give a little bit of a background uh, for purposes of us understanding, maybe uh, 
his work, uh, Professor Gadi's work um, here. When he wrote, when he has written about uh, inter the African uh, engagement with international law, his previous scholarship, uh, he has uh, sort of um, created um, two sort of views that exist or strands that exist on the engagement of international law in Africa. He has said that one strand is mainly contributionist and the other strand is mainly critical. And the contributionist strand, he has said, is a strand mainly that says, we uh, as Africans have been involved and have contributed to the creation of rules and principles of international law. And he has, uh, for example, labeled the African scholar uh, Taslim Oluwale Elias, who uh, is uh, one of the big African scholars in a, 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 um, uh, credited for many things, including the formation of OHADA. He was part of the um, Court of Arbitration for Sports, and he also sat in the International Court of Justice as one of the scholars who has been a uh, contributionist. So the idea of contribution is pretty simple, uh, is to disagree with the view that Africa is uh, uh, a historical, it doesn't have any history, uh, and that uh, Africa uh, therefore cannot create theory, and therefore Africa did not create any international law. And you can extend this to other uh, Global South um, countries. It's a very uh, Hegelian view that inferiorizes the um, uh, peoples or ideas that are not from the global north, in this case, Europe. And therefore, uh, part of what the contributionists have said, they have said that Africa, and in this case, you can even think about Asia, has engaged or engaged with international law from the beginning. African uh, countries, including uh, Tunisia in the Carthage eras, had treaties with Europe, and therefore African and African civilizations have been involved from the beginning in the creation and in the perpetuation of international law. So that, that is the contributionist strand. And this is very important for purposes of us understanding where I'm going with this and my commentary generally on the paper. But the critical stand, uh, strand has been a little bit different. And um, this critical strand is one which has sort of come up with a more, uh, you know, sort of a, a more glam view of international law and more difficult view of not, of, of not just accepting that uh, uh, the global South here generally contributed to international law, but saying that, uh, you know, international law itself got created in the process of uh, interacting with the global South peoples that international law ideas were not created in Europe and then applied in the global south as certain mainstream views would, uh, would, would, would present. Um, even questioning the Westphalian idea itself and saying that that idea is not true. The leading uh, sort of view here is presented by Professor Anthony Engi, who has written uh, a nice book on this, on how uh, international law doctrines, for example, the doctrine of sovereignty was created when uh, the um, global north, Europe specifically, interacted with the global south through colonization. So all the epochs of jurisprudential thinking from natural law to positivism, to, you know, um, pragmatism, and even the the... The, the globalization era have all perpetuated what Engie has called um, dynamic of difference. That this is the line that separates the global south and the global north, mainly racially. And then you try to come up with technologies for uh, making the global south, which is mainly uh, seen to be inferior, better. So you civilize the global south, for example, or you develop the global south. So the idea of the civilization mission or even the development paradigm comes from this idea. 
And so you can think about uh, uh, the twelve sort of agenda within those two strands. Now, as we speak and as we think about this paper, maybe we need to ask ourselves, where does this paper fall in terms of either being contributionist or critical? And where, do, where is the scholarship that you've engaged with in international law for? My experience as a student, uh, when I, I encountered international law as an undergraduate student specifically, was mainly the mainstream idea. I was convinced and I was told that international law was born out of the Westphalian treaties and that, you know, the um, Westphalian treaties and the year 1648 is very important for international law. And many of the doctrines that come out of that have then been distributed in other parts of the world. In my engagement, other views or uh, the periphery of international law was not taken as seriously or was not engaged with as seriously. But it's just my experience as a student. So I met uh, strong critiques of international law when I went for my um, graduate studies and uh, even further when I uh, met um, Professor Gadi himself. So that's sort of the background. Um, so I don't know what is happening. What are you seeing now? I can see the slides. Uh, what has international law promised? Uh, yeah, I thought that is the question you asked uh, me, uh, Mike, and it has promised global uh, social justice, uh, but has delivered not so much of that in the global South and in the global West, global social justice socioeconomic justice, it has promised equality and equity, but for the peoples of the global south from colonialism and the continuities of colonialism and uh, extreme poverty, uh, uh, these promises of emancipation have not been fulfilled. And there's also promised development, but these have not been fu fulfilled or there have been contestation of fulfilling uh, of some of this. And I think part of what the um, third world approaches to international law scholars are saying is that we need to dig up the reason of why this, has, uh, this is so. We need to dig up the history to explain this and then to understand why some of these things are continuing. Why is it that there is a third world in the global south and why is it um, that, why is it that there's a third world in the first world? And why is it that we have a first world in the third world? Now, the third world is, as uh, uh, the first part of Gadi's uh, paper, uh, sort of, um, if you look at the introduction says, the third world is a geographic, it is a political, and it is an epistemic location. It is a geographic location because it was labeled so, and the third world therefore includes mainly in, during the Cold War time, uh, uh, the countries that were not part of the first and the second world, which were the ones who were mainly involved in the, in the Cold War. Everyone else was it. And it followed therefore that the third world included mainly countries that had uh, our former colonies in Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia. So it's a geographical space. We think about the third world and we think about it as a geographical space. But uh, Twailers have also said, uh, don't think only about it as a geographical space because it has a political content. Third worldism has a political content. It is not just a space where people live, but it, is a, it has a political consciousness. But even more important is that it, it has an epistemic conscious, a place where knowledge is generated and is distributed. And Prof. Gadi argues that the third worldism, the third uh, 12 scholars have been uh, pushing for is a third worldism that is anti-subordination. -sub uh, uh, so the term is not only geographic, but it is an anti-subordination term. And why do we need to talk about anti-subordination? Uh, because in international law discourse, and not just in international law, in very many endeavors of life, the third world has been subordinated. For example, that the third world cannot produce appropriate history, uh, 
that the third world cannot produce appropriate international law, that the third world cannot produce, you know, appropriate and, uh, you know, exportable culture, and even more that the third world does not have any kind of civilization. So the, even the civilizations of the third world in Africa uh, were subordinated. So it is a consciousness movement of saying there is part of this. And remember that that sounds more as a contributionist agenda, saying we, we also contributed to civilization. We also have contributed to international law. We also have been involved in the shaping of international law. So that's mainly how we, we should think about the, uh, the, 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 the third world. But also we should think about it as an epistemic location. Uh, that this is a place where knowledge is produced. This is a place where ideas can be produced. And that, uh, of course, is, is important. And the, the entire first part of the paper is really a presentation of, of, for me, how epistemic international law knowledge can be produced in Africa. But that it is completely marginalized. You will rarely find, like he says, cases from uh, the African Court on Human People's Rights, or cases from the East African Court of Justice, or cases from the ECOWAS Court of Justice in mainstream uh, textbooks. It's very, uh, you, you'll, rare, you'll rarely see this being presented as what you would expect as part of international law. So that's uh, an important aspect. The other point that he makes very strongly that we need to engage with and think around is the epistemic silencing of the third world. And, and for us who are in this meeting and for myself, we are mainly thinking about how we have learned and how we have unlearned, the learning and unlearning that we have engaged with. So if you read, for example, some of the works of uh, Professor Boaventura de Souza Santos, he says that there cannot be social justice without cognitive justice. And many of us sometimes do not even, are not even aware that they have, been, they have gone through cognitive violence because it's not violence in the same way that you uh, understand uh, sort of, it's, it's it, to use a, a scientific term, it's structural violence that uh, what you have been taught is not what is going to save the people who live around you if you are interested in any sense with, with uh, social justice. So the first point there is that understanding the world extends or exceeds understanding just the Western world. Again, seems like a contributionist sort of um, idea, you know, that epistemologies of the South are also important, that places of knowledge generation in the South, places where international law is produced in the South is also important. And of course, there cannot be global justice without um, a cognitive justice. So still therefore, a six to emancipate and to follow the grammars and scripts that have been developed in the places that are not uh, Europe, or America and voices that are not in Europe or America to prevent to present international law. So I would ask myself, therefore, at this point, which of these voices I know, or which of these voices I sat uh, or engaged with in my international law class, uh, if um, you have sat in an international law uh, space or teaching that are not Western, that are uh, from the global South. And, and if you haven't, why are they not there? Is it that this, the, the, the voices are being excluded or they actually don't exist? You know, there's that, that other argument that they, they don't exist. But Twila is uh, saying they actually exist. That's the main uh, agenda of Twila and that even more of this should be generated. So uh, Professor, Professor Gadi says, uh, cites the works of James uh, Sekej Youngblood. Uh, that's uh, Anderson. Uh, that's a type on, on the... Um, on the slide, as you know, this idea of cognitive imprisonment, cognitive violence, and the kinds of spiritual injuries that Adrian Wing also speaks about, that you can be in cognitive imprisonment. And this I say because if the only idea of international law that is presented to you is the mainstream agenda, which is most of the time very positivistic, positive law, 
very much based on rules and that you have to stick to these rules and does not accept or does not include, uh, let's put it that way, uh, voices or ideas in the periphery. So if your international law did not center colonialism, if your international law did not center the slave, uh, slavery, and if your international law did not explain how slavery, how colonialism subsisted at the same time with um, normal international law, uh, there is a problem. And, and what then are the explanations for this? And have these things ended? That's part of the, of the idea. Then there's the eclectic aspect of the trail movement, that the trail movement is not um, sort of bounded and not, uh, it's open to views and very many uh, uh, different sort of subject matters. So you can think about feminism, for example, because this is an example that he presents to us. And uh, the works of Vasuki Nesia are important here. And I think even Elizabeth V. Spellman's work on the inessential woman, so, uh, and the intersectionalities of oppression of women of color, and why this is important. I think Adrian Wing's uh, work is also important here. And here it's the idea is the rejection of the view that there is a universalistic uh, person or woman who international law will save and because, because of the intersectionalities. So we were in another forum with John just before this one, where this, this specifically was the topic. And um, I was asked to speak and um, yeah, it didn't go very well in the end. <laughs> I was trying to tell Chico that, uh, you know, we were told we, we, we were over speaking, we were speaking down on women and we were mansplaining. Uh, and yeah, so that's, I, I don't want to, to, to go so much into this. We can discuss this and I, I will be very happy to engage with the ladies um, on this topic here as much as possible. Um, if I'm allowed to speak, as a subaltern voice. What about trail and the history of racial oppression? And here, uh, uh, Professor Gadi cites the very incisive works of Henry Richardson III. And he writes about how, uh, especially Af the engagements that African Americans have had with international law from the times of slavery up to the times of the civil rights movement and to this day of globalization and how the voices especially of African-Americans and their views of how to use international law for emancipatory purposes were not taken seriously and how they tried to employ the use of international law for such purposes. I have also spoke about Anthony Engi's framework uh, for how non-European uh, uh, society encountered international law and the topic of the dynamic of difference or the theory of the dynamic of difference and how it has developed over time. Again, uh, international law of the twill flavor tries to center the racial oppression that has existed uh, in the past and how international law is used not only as a tool of emancipation, but as a tool that uh, can, uh, has caused you know, um, racism and uh, and supported colonialism and if we speak today maybe and we strongly uh, submit has uh, supported neocolonialism so if these aspects if these topics are not topics that are centered in your learning of international economic law in your learning of international environmental law in your learning of international criminal law you know, in all those sort of uh, areas of or, 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 or topics of international law, then there is a, a huge silencing that is taking place of the global South epistemologies that are important for you in order for you to achieve cognitive justice. For like uh, 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 I said previously, there cannot be social justice without cognitive justice. The, 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 the other aspect that is presented here is scholars that, uh, whose work sometimes is not centered in mainstream, um, in mainstream conversations. So you can think about R.P. Anand, who's an Indian scholar whose work is also very interesting, of, of the first generation of twin. 
uh, and um, he, uh, being a Yale graduate, went out and wrote very critically about how he saw his worldview and how he saw international law. Mohamed Bedjawi, Algerian, just like Taslim uh, Elias, also sat at the ICJ and is a, uh, wrote a, 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 an interesting book on international economic law, on how to think about international economic law from the trail perspective. And of course, Bupinda Chimney, Indian, whose work um, uh, is uh, the, the, the cover that is there is part of his work. Upendra Bakshi, human rights law, uh, with a very global South uh, flavor and idea. Mm -hmm. Christopher Waramantri, who was also a judge at the ICJ, and Kamal Hussein, just a few names of people who have had what are called rebel imaginations. Uh, many, uh, maybe many of these are of the, uh, many of these names are of the first, um, first sort of uh, twelve one movement. That's why you see only men, but the twelve two two movement has had even more and uh, you know females involved in the movement so it's it's not it's an eclectic movement trail as we know it or as we engage with it um, and lastly you know uh trail tries to contest colonialism and its continuities and here you might think about why we say that political colonialism ended but economic colonialism has continued from an investment perspective from a trade perspective um, from a commercial perspective, uh, the ideas of Kwame Nkrumah and his, uh, and his view of, of neocolonialism as the last stage of imperialism are good to engage with. And this is a, very, this is a political thinker presenting ideas that have a very strong trail flavor. But the idea that uh, you know, imperialism continues up to today is central to the trail movement, is central to trailian thinking. Most of this conversation has just been relating to the second part of uh, Professor Gadi's um, paper uh, in terms of me thinking about the reflection and in terms of me trying to uh, you know, say what I thought about the promise of international law from a third world perspective. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harrison. I think that was that was quite uh, informative, and uh, I think a good introduction for everyone to uh, take it from that and be included, asking questions, contributing. Uh, a person noted uh, the idea of cognitive violence and imprisonment. I think it's, uh, it's something that I think I haven't thought of, and definitely I think many people now are thinking about that uh, aspect. Um, I noted just to get. To summarize what you said, you know, the idea of contributionists who are trying to participate in the formation of international law. Uh, uh, international law, they believe this is a product of a number of civilizations rather than a one, so it's quite an idea of inter-civilization. Uh, on the other side, as you noted, which is critical theorists, again, you know, who are trying to say that modern international law continues to be a legacy, it continues a legacy of uh, colonial disempowerment, and you not on that last point uh, about economic subjugation, which is still going on. So maybe just on that uh, last part of, 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 of um, you know, economic subjugation that's still on, uh, I can just take now from uh, Nyanjo so to um, come in and also take up the discussion from there. Let's see if he's ready already. Now people just prepare questions. Uh, I think there'll be more, more, more questions to that. Is John there? Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's. Uh, it's good hearing from Harrison and uh, and his analysis of of the of the issues. If at any time you'll not be able to hear me, uh, you you can just let me know. Uh, forgot to recognize somebody who I really have a lot of high regard uh, for in, in in this forum, and that's uh, Christian Kam in International Dispute Settlement World. 
would not have grown that much were it's not for Christian Campbell who runs the foreign direct investment mood. So it's it's nice to see Christian here and to see that he is participating in some of these issues. So thank you very much, Christian. Uh, so where I want to begin is I want to begin on uh, Professor Gadi's uh, paper of this Grotius lecture. So when I when I read the Grotius lecture, so first I must disclose I'm not a 12 card carrying member, though I, I consider myself a traveler through through 12 sometimes. Uh, I, and that is because of personal reasons of, of some of the issues that I will highlight in my in my discussion. Uh, uh, yeah. In reviewing Gadi's work, I, I first before I get to the to the to the to the sub uh, to the epistemic locations, I I, I first view uh, how he thinks international law in Africa should be should be shaped, and and Professor Gadi, I must admit, has very uh, uh, good ideas of how he thinks. We, we, we should develop and how international law de should develop in these areas. So for example, he gives cases, he gives examples of environmental law cases. He gives examples of the, uh, of, of the tribunals in, in the criminal tribunals in Rwanda. He also gives examples of the ECOWAS uh, cases. And, and this led me to one area that I had a couple of weeks to go back and review. Because while I agree with Professor Gadi and Harrison that you can see from, from, from the work that is being produced, it cannot be argued, as Professor Gadi puts it correctly, that there is no place of development of international law in Africa. In fact, uh, Professor Gadi, is, as, he, as, as he has shown in the Grotius lecture, that the issues of, 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 of environmental law now, are, are, are some of them emerging in, in, some, in some scenarios, especially if you think of private international law interests. And, and the same for international criminal law. So this led me to, to, to start thinking of, of how these national courts are actually, if at all, taking interest in international environmental law. And, and I went into an analysis of, of international environmental law courts in Africa, and specifically I focused on the Kenyan one. And I agree with Professor Gadi that these courts are now taking an interest into the development of international law. What is paradoxical is that these courts are not taking interest into the development of international law that is African. So the question then becomes, is there a development of international law that is African? So if you pick, for example, random case law of international environmental law at the Environmental Land Court in Kenya, at least 45 of the cases that I have analyzed, there were only at least five cases where there is quotes from African international law textbook. All the others emerge from international law textbooks that are not African. And secondly, also you find an influx of international law case law not from African regional to deal with environmental issues into this works. And therefore the question then begs is, if at all the argument is that these courts are approaching the international law that uh, we have always thought that they have never been involved in, is it the right kind of international law? Because we all know that the international law that is taught around the world is not the same, it differs from one area to another, and it depends with, with how you sit. For example, there is a lot of the Kyoto Protocol, if you look at the environment on land court of Kenya. But there has been a, a big argument, including by 12 scholars themselves, that the Kyoto Protocol has actually been a hindrance to the development of international law. In fact, Alvarez, in his 101, uh, a lecture of the American Society of International Law, where he gave the 50 problems facing international law. He says one of them is the Kyoto Protocol. But then this is the kind of international law that we purport to put out as scholars of 12. And therefore this for me, I find it problematic coming from these judicial bodies. 
So I think that Professor Gadi and other 12 scholars must look into deeper into this type of international law that they push as being uh, uh, advanced by these regional courts. I think while it is, it is the starting point, for me, you would rather put a correct international law if there's such a uh, than putting just the international law. Because there is a systematical ripple effect from these judgments into academic work. And, and subsequently, the coming generations pick case law in this type of workings into what they think should be international law. Now, I go to the lecture, the, the closing lecture of Jean Dospomont at the African Society of International Law Closing Conference, as I speak on this area of international environmental law. And Jean Dospomont says this in his closing lecture of the ISIL in Durban, South Africa. He says, I am a white man here, a French for that matter, who teaches at Science Po on the University of Manchester, who is being told to give a closing remark on the African Society of International Law Conference in an African content. Now, Jean Dospomont says he notes throughout the conference that this culture of writings of people who presented at the conference and what we call African International Environmental Law is in fact written by African international law scholars that sit in Europe or America. And for me, this is no problem at all. At all. I, this is why I differ with Jean Dospamont. I don't think this is a problem. The problem for me is whether this type of international law suffices to the cultural and historical uh, underpinnings of our environment as international law scholars in Africa. And that is why I think therefore scholars of Twail and in this sense should think more deeply of the type of international law espoused in the judgments of some of these areas. So this is one area I think Professor Gadi ought to have looked into much deeper. Secondly, is the area of how this international law is made. Now, there is an area where we should focus on as twelve, and one of the areas that I have managed to pick up is the legality of international law treatises that came into place through a forceful colonial process and now have to be adopted into our legal systems. So any treatises that we have taken into account from the colonial period and now have to bind us into our modern ways of international and delimitation case and this is case of uh, Court of Justice with Nijor. Now, if you look at that case, that case is not um, an international, international, an international maritime case because essentially what they are, they are telling the International Court of Justice, we have two treatises that came into place during the colonial era put in place by France that are supposed to govern our maritime delimitation. Can you tell us whether they apply to us or not? And this is a problem that I agree with Gavi on. It seems that still the colonial mind of how these criticisms should come into place is something that really troubles many African countries up to date. I mean, there is no reason for Equatorial Guinea to be going to the International Court of Justice to tell an International Court of Justice, tell us the applicability of these treatises. It is because of the process that these treatises came into place. Now, there is a need for 12 scholars to interrogate deeply the treatises that we have adopted over a period of time as African international law that govern our areas of international law. And this specifically in maritime delimitation, 
in boundary delimitation. Those are areas that we ought to look into deeper as scholars of international law. Because the problem that is ailing us is that we are subjecting ourselves into an international law fora of deciding whether the applicability of this international law actually applies to us while we are at the same time fighting hegemonical stances of how this international law is actually in place. Secondly, I go to the, the, the epistemic locations of, of international law as, as Harry has, has argued. And I agree with her in totality that there is a place for building of the, uh, 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 because Gadi gives this uh, examples of law made in New York or Geneva or London or Paris uh, or Vienna, for example, and not the law made in Arusha or in, or in Malabo or in Nairobi. And, and, and these epistemic locations are very important in, in, in the development of international law, and I agree with Harrison completely, that we must build a collaborative effort towards ensuring that these locations that we put in place for development of international law gets a chance at the high table of international law. But then what Gavi does not disclose in this paper is that some of this international law is frowned upon in some areas because of our culture and habits that we have created over time and some of the criticism that has been put of these areas of international law. So I agree with Gavi on terms of the critique that was put by Rachel Murray in terms of the uh, Court of Human Rights. I don't find the critique really reasonable from the background of how the court was developing. But let's take an example of the SADC Tribunal. Now the SADC Tribunal that was put in place for the uh, solving of the investment dispute becomes a big issue here because what you end up having then is a tribunal that is killed on biases of, 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 on biases, on biases of states not wanting certain decisions made by courts. And then these same uh, uh, decisions are what then hurt us internationally. Because you put, for example, and I have had this conversation, for example, with Lohos Boson Shazun on, 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 on putting, for example, the SADC tribunal before, before the, 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 as, as, as an equivalent of investment courts around the world. Now, if you have states that at the bottom line of them have a problem with the decisions of these tribunals in these epistemic locations, as Gadi puts them, then, we, then this international law is not going to be able to be solved in, in the international sphere as we want it. It will be hard for us to sell decisions of the SADC tribunal to our counterparts in Europe and the Americas if we are not in itself promoting these this issues of international law. And therefore there is a need for us to ensure that, that, that these epistemic locations are protected by zeal and zest through treatises, through obedience of rule of law, and as Harry has put it in another forum, there must be, uh, uh, there must be organizing and mobility towards this, because there is no way that law made in Arusha or, Jimi or, or Arusha or, 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 or Mozambique is going to be respected in international law spheres in Geneva or Vienna, if we at all are not promoting this type of international law back home here. So states must be put in a position make African uh, 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 epistemic locations, they must abide to it. There is a place for abiding to it. And one of the disappointments is the SADC tribunal. And we must, and as the SADC tribunal round comes back and it's been set up afresh to hear new cases, we must ensure protection of these epistemic locations. And that is very important. Now, as I conclude, I think of what. I think is excellent piece of work and especially the listing of, of the works. This is where I, I want to begin. Andrea Bianchi uh, writes a paper on, on questioning on questions of international law, uh, theory and philosophy of international law. And I like Andrea Bianchi 
And I think this is a challenge that I want to throw out for all of us in terms of thinking of our, of our, of, of, of our future of toil and international law of how we should build it. Andrea Bianchi says, what international law needs today is less professionals, less intellectuals, and more amateurs. And I agree with, uh, sorry, more intellectuals, less professionals, and more amateurs. And I agree in totality with Andrea Bianchi. Because we, the amateurs of international law, are the ones that are not afraid to question issues of international law affecting the third world. Take, for example, Mati Koskiniemi, and this is in no way uh, 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 a, a bad criticism. I think his, his earlier works of, of third world of in, international law are actually exceptional, no doubt about it. But a lot of people, including the likes of Jean Dos Pamons, think his work is now diluted into mainstream international law. And therefore, these, if these are the people who we are going to be expecting to push our agenda of international law, it is something that we may not be able to achieve in our lifetimes very easily. And therefore, I think there is a place for us as amateurs of international law, like Andrea Bianchi says, that we, the amateurs, are not subject to rules of international law. It will be hard for developed African international laws, lawyers to question some of the issues, even though they think are not right. But I think for us as amateurs, there is a place for us to question international law, as Andrea Bianchi puts it. Secondly, George Abisab in his 2015 lecture, I in, in, in closing uh, the, the 12 conference in Egypt, where he speaks of whether we are challenging perspectives or speaking behind enemy lines in international law. George Abisab says this. There are two categories of people you must not fail, you must fail, you must not try to confuse. One, there is international lawyers who are intellectuals, and then you have international lawyers who are just contributionists. And the bigger part of the development of African international lawyers, George Abisab argues, are not intellectuals. They are just international lawyers. They are not intellectuals. They know international law by the book, the international law that they have read from past of colonialism, and that is the international law they put in place. The international law or lawyers that we must start questioning now are the intellectuals. So we must distinguish these two types of African international lawyers. Those intellectuals, those who sit in international dispute settlement bodies, those who sit in upper echelons of our academia, these are the peoples that we must put at the forefront of what we want as the future of international law from a third world perspective, especially from Africa. And, and, and this has also been repeated by, by, by Chimney as well. So I think there is a place for us not taking international law put up front by international, African international lawyers around the world who are not even intellectuals per se. Now this is what I this is where I I want to to conclude. Alvarez uh, in in the 2010 conference in Twelve in Paris, uh, in his thoughts he says, on listening to Twailers, he ends up with with three problems that he thinks Twailers are not tackling and they must think about it. He thinks about development of 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 of, of criticism. Two. He thinks about uh, ju judicialization of, 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 uh, of, of decisions and proliferation. And of course, proliferation is, is a great, in fact, I think one of the ways we are going to sell up third world international law is through proliferation. We must allow proliferation of judicial bodies. We must have as many courts as we want as many places as Gadi says, these epistemological places are where we'll put these courts is where we're going to develop our international law. That is very important. But Gadi questions how toilers are going to fight modern international law without fighting the basics of, 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 of international law. So he says, for example, you have a group of toilers that argue that you cannot subject somebody to an institution that they consider illegitimate. 
A good example would be then the International Criminal Court. What then happens if we are unable to submit these people who commit heinous crimes in the third world to a court like the International Criminal Court, which for argument, for argument purposes, let's agree that the criticism leveled against it are actually really correct. Then what happens to the administration of justice that toilers really fight for if they are for themselves arguing against, for example, submission of, of people through international law processes like the International Criminal Court without creation of alternatives? Now, this creation of alternatives is important. But before this creation of alternatives, we must ensure accountability of international law through the already existent bodies. Because failure to do so, that leaves us at a place where one, we are fighting a hegemonic system, but two, we are not dealing with the issues that this hegemonic system is going to deal with, even with or without it. Now, lastly, international economic law. International economic law, and, and, and this is an area that Twail has really dominated a lot, especially in terms of capital exploitation. And my friends like Harrison have put a lot of amazing work out there about it. I, I think, I think we, this is what Alvarez is, is speaking about. For example, my friend Harrison, and he will say if I'm wrong, argues that in fact, we can get rid of the ISDA system as it stands today. The alternative offered is uh, maybe a national court, maybe a regional court. In fact, Harrison has told me that he thinks maybe we can adopt the FCFTA mechanism in, in terms of, 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 of developing, of, developing of, of having these disputes hard. My problem is that areas of international, areas of, Twelve must start thinking of areas of international law as very different and providing different solutions from them. Because such solutions for international economic law are, in my view, almost impossible. Because if it is international uh, uh, criminal law, then we could argue that it is solvable here. But when you have parties who have a big interest outside our normal norms, outside our geographical areas, then arguing that you're going to force those parties and subject them to an international law created by yourself, influenced by yourself, and in your own jurisdiction, then we end up with the same hegemonic systems that we have been fighting. We have been fighting against. Trailers must really reconsider each area of international law as unique, providing unique solutions for them and dealing with them in a different way. And that will be my views for now. Thank you very much, John. I think that was very, very, very interesting <coughs> uh, discussion, alternative discussion. And uh, as Harrison's waiting to, to answer, uh, I would just go uh, highlight on what I got from uh, in this discussion. And uh, he talks about uh, the insisting of epistemic location, which sometimes we have to question the quality of knowledge it produces in the first place and, and, and what it is. I mean, is that knowledge that is appealing? Can we sell that knowledge? Uh, you know, the production of decisions from our legal courts, can they actually be convincing and, and, and be useful in their perspective? Uh, he talks about also if the production of knowledge that we create or we, we say that you're creating from our own courts, are they themselves Africans? Who are we citing and all that? Um, he goes also to cultures and, and habits that uh, seem to somewhat discourage the adoption of, of, of you know, the global north when adopting our decisions are we actually you know uh conforming to them is there the cultures and, and norms like rule of law are we following that so he talks also about amateurs that we should get a space to to contribute and interact with international law we don't have boundaries i like that so much and he goes into implementation and he's almost finishing the, the discussion that we are, we are somewhat contesting implementation of international law. These institutions that we don't want to submit to, yet we're not creating any alternatives. And I think that 
I have happened to sit in a, in a same debate that Harrison addressed that question, and I think we'll pick it up again. It talks about different solutions, uh, which pertains to different, that we shouldn't, uh, you know, treat health solutions as these wide scope solutions that should cover all the aspects of international. So he, he's telling us that we should have partition solutions, we should study each part of international, if it's criminal, and be able to provide solutions accordingly. He talks about uh, um, you know, big interest. So you want to subject this big, big interest which are outside our scope of capacity, I guess, our meant. Are we also going to subjugate or something? So just invite Harrison and, and take each in time. And, and I think from them, then we can invite the audience to contribute. Thank you, Harrison. Yeah, um, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, John, for the um, uh, wonderful presentation. And um, maybe I can just respond on a few points that I thought um, are uh, important to highlight. So on investor state dispute settlement, uh, which you can say that I have uh, said, um, or you can categorize uh, 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 me as a rejection. First of all, think about the, that is an asymmetric system. Um, and I mean, I don't think, I, I've not had any person who has said, I mean, this is a system where the investor who's mainly transporting transnational capital into, into mainly global South countries um, is allowed to sue the state outside the avenues of the state and the state, you know, all the state can do is to be sued. If you use a mainstream agenda, you will ask yourself, then the state have signed those treaties or the, the treaty you have accepted. But if you think about the reckoning that is currently happening in the ISDS system, there are questions including the asymmetry of the system that has been asked. Uh, so John said that the alternatives that have been offered are not good alternatives. But these uh, uh, ideas have been on the time. And it's not just that we are saying that disputes should not be resolved or investor state disputes should not be resolved. We're saying that they should be resolved, but the system should be changed, needs a lot of changes. In of a national treatment uh, or uh, to put it more clearly, uh, uh, a solution of this dispute first at the domestic level then you can think about going to uh, a higher level. And in, in my view, uh, we have very many judicial systems at the sub-regional and at the regional level in Africa right now that can deal with this dispute. And I don't think the view that says, look, that is your court, you have put your own judges inside there is, um, is fair because at the end of the day, when you set up in a state that is, uh, an ordinary state in the global south, uh, you should grant the possibility that uh, the judicial systems in this state can resolve these disputes, unless you're coming with a cultural, uh, you know, dynamic of, of difference of, of saying, oh, courts in the global south do not work, judges in the global south are bribed, judges in the global south, uh, you know, will not rule in our favor, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, you can have a long list of, of, of what that uh, says. But courts in the global north are good. Uh, if we do our arbitration in London, it's okay. In Geneva, it's fine. But no, 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 not in Kigali. Kigali, I mean, we don't know the place. We don't know whether it's good enough or no, 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 no. Uh, not in Abuja. I mean, you can, you can start seeing why... Uh, uh, why, why the alternatives that we offer should be taken seriously. For example, the OHADA system. Why, why we can take the OHADA system as a good example for solving this investor state um, disputes. Then there's a SADC problem. And, and here, uh, I, let me paint it uh, like this. It is also related to investor state. The government of Robert Mugabe which was authoritarian and which 12 scholars have argued against authoritarianism and dictatorship decided that it was going to expropriate land from white settlers without compensation. 
If you go to any property law class, you will be told that you cannot expropriate without compensation. The only way you can have a legal expropriation um, is if you compensate. But in Zimbabwe, they said no. And even in South Africa, there are certain very strong political streams that are saying no. And they are using a twill historical argument. They are saying that uh, the settlers took this land through unequal treaties, mostly through a colonial system that did not give the voice of the people from whom the land was taken away from the chance to engage in any meaningful way with transferring this land. How is it then that now we have to talk about expropriation without compensation? This is a very tough issue. I think uh, uh, from a 12 perspective, I think the resolution seems quite straightforward to me, but uh, it is a very emotive issue that has historical background. This is how the Sadiq Tribunal died. It died because the Sadiq Tribunal ruled in a formal manner that you can't expropriate without compensation because that is what the law says. But what about historical injustices? But what about colonialism? Uh, where, where is the space for us to discuss some of this and ask ourselves how some of those issues are also important for purposes of social justice? Otherwise, uh, proliferation of tribunals and pro proliferation of treaties, like uh, John has said, Alvarez ad has advised, that are mainly fomented in a hierarchical system that continues or uh, co uh, continues the, he the hegemony that international law has been viewed for for a long time. So you will just keep on creating systems or keep on creating or signing treaties and creating uh, judicial resolution systems that perpetuate this uh, uh, system. So that's that's what I will uh, sort of say in response. But uh, I, there was one, one that was on the comments that I would also like to respond before I turn it back to you, Mike. I think someone asked, uh, is subalternity fixed or does it depend on the power imbalances in the room? If the latter, if it depends on the latter, the power imbalances on the room, would you consider yourself a subaltern voice in this room, uh, in this room zoom, in this zoom room? I am basically asking whether you believe gender and other identity markers impact subalternity. My first answer is that yes, power is involved. There are power imbalances. So it is the latter. Now, if it is the latter, the second question then becomes, do I think I am a subaltern voice? Yes, I am a subaltern voice. I, I, I am in, in my location uh, as we speak today is the global north, but I'm a subaltern voice. Why, why not? I'm born in Africa. I'm bred in Africa. If I were to speak in Chino Achebe's terms, my umbilical cord was buried in Africa. I am, I am a subaltern voice. Um, then, then the, the, in this room, in this Zoom room, yes, true, surely. Uh, and I don't have to say that I am black because it is obvious. But am I? The other question is. Am I basically, now the last question on this one is, is whether you believe gender and other identity markers impact subaltern status? Of course, because of intersectionalities, uh, the, the, the experiences of Harrison, the man, and the experiences of say my wife, who's also from a subaltern location are not the same. Her, her, her worldview might be different from mine. The, the, the gender intersectionality might affect my subaltern view and voice. Religion too, whether I am Islamic, Christian, agnostic, Hindu, Buddhist, all, all those other identity markers affect the subalternity involved in the room and should be given due consideration. That's my view. Thank you.
Um, Harrison, I don't know if I can be heard first of all. Yeah, um, so if you're done responding now, I think we can proceed into the Q&A, unless, I don't know if John also wanted to respond to your response. I don't, I don't think so. Um, unfortunately, though, you answered Nicola's question while she's out of the discussion, but then I think she can listen to the recording. So we can just go ahead. If anyone has a question, they can put it either in the chat or they can just raise their hand. But you can begin with another question that was in the chat. I think it's by Rono. Um, yeah. Hold on, sorry. Yeah, his question is whether international law is a law or morality by yeah, Arnold Rono from Moy University, I think. I don't know. John, do you want to take that one or do you want to <laughs> Yeah, Harrison, is it because of my my religious views? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So law and morality are two different things. You don't even have to think of it as international law. Uh, law and morality are said to be two, two, two different areas that should not mix. But but that has not been the case for international law, for example. Uh, and Harrison will tell you clearly that a lot of international law is developed from Judeo-Christianity. No doubt about that. There is a lot. That is why when, uh, when, when, when the European nations sought to create states, they refused to acknowledge Africa and Latin America as, as it is today. Some of them, they refused to acknowledge some of them as states. But yet they recognize the Holy See as a, as, as a state as, as, a, as a state form of territory, but they refuse to, to recognize some of it. So there, there is the law and morality are two different things in international law, but there is a lot of influence of Judeo-Christianity in international law. There, there is no doubt about that, that there is a lot of influence of Judeo-Christianity in international law. And that's why I give you a good example of formation of states, and you find something like the Holy See being granted almost a status of the state. There's no any other reasons apart from Judeo-Christianity and not to other African states. So there are two different things and there's a lot of reading, both domestic and international in, in the presence of this, but there's a lot of influence of uh, religion into international law today as it is. And of course, this also goes into international human rights law. Uh, there is an influence of international, of religion, in international human rights law. And that's why issues like um, women rights, children rights have, have had a big problem with Latin American states and Asian states, not even African states. You'd be surprised that there was a lot of dissenting voices from Latin America and Asian states in terms of the influence of religion into international law. And that's why like the uh, Tokyo conferences had, had a lot of opposition from Latin American countries and Asian countries because of influence on religion. So, so it's, it's, they're two separate things, but the influences, especially of into international law, are, are so much into it and we, we over time we need to, to separate them and and even in judgments naturally right even in judgments naturally you you find this this problem i give you a good example the the case of of, of the of the finnish woman uh with the finnish prime minister then and how it ended up in the international in, in the in the in the in the european court of human rights you you have upper echelon of courts of international law who think gold digging is, is, is a concept of, of modern issues until international courts tell them you have to separate your moralities and, 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 and international law. These are, these are two different types of issues. So there is an influx of them, but they should be separate and distinct. The problem is now how to have them separate and distinct. It is, it is not easy because some of our states are built because the basis of international law states, some of our states are built on fundamental fears of God, right? And, and when you have the creators of international law, so let's leave private international law aside, the creators of international law who are the most influential states, having a fear of God, mixing national and that essentially is happening in many spheres of international law today. But essentially, there should be distinct types of things. 
Okay, thank you for that. I think um, Rono has been answered. I think we can proceed to Aaron Onyango. His, his hand was raised. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, I actually do have a question that also does make a comment. Uh, firstly, uh, to all the speakers who have spoken today, I actually personally I do not take the position of being a twail. I am actually anti twail because I do believe that twailers take a very reactive approach to uh, third world uh, or the global affairs related to the global south. And most specific, my question is uh, like, don't you think this position about that has been mentioned about he hegemony is hypocritical to the extent that? Uh, these scholars have no problem with the Western hegemony when it comes to protection, when it comes to wars, when it comes to military assistance, when it comes to the hegemony of the Security Council, when it comes to hegemony when it, of uh, uh, donor aid or financial assistance. But uh, these specific matters or these specific affairs like uh, borders, uh, trade deals, all of a sudden we have to take an African approach. Now that is where the problem comes in. And I think this is shooting ourselves in the foot when, when it comes to some affairs, you say it's okay, we have no problem with these treaties that were established in the 1800s, 1900s that we acceded to. But when it comes to these other ones established at the same time, or even in the same conferences, now we have a problem. We think it is uh, hypocritical. Uh, secondly, Another issue I have with uh, this third world approach or the, the, the many trailers take is we need our own system. That I do agree with to that extent. But the systems that uh, are enunciated mirror completely, mirror, this, mirror the global north. And uh, we actually had this, this discussion earlier with some members in this, in this forum where I believe that these are countries that established or have been in existence, or states that have been in existence in one way or another in, uh, for, for centuries, if not millennia. Some of them, they do not have the same issues we have, like for instance, border, border reprisals or border, border issues, because they had their treaties in the 12th century and the 13th century. And here we are, countries that have been independent, some for less than three decades, some less than four decades, and we want to establish uh, uh, our own, for instance, our own judicial systems. We want to establish our own uh, economic systems in such a way that uh, are able to compete with these other systems on a global scale and think it's going to work when these other systems have had millennia or centuries, a couple of centuries to to, 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 to streamline themselves to trial and error and that. So is, is it really possible or is this approach really just uh, re very reactive and uh, in short, shoot, us shooting ourselves in the foot because they, it lacks visibility. It is mirrored greatly on uh, the global north and uh, it lacks uh, uh, an African component or rather a component that is uh, tested and uh, decisively African, if I can say. Um, okay, it seems both Harrison and John were getting ready to reply. So I think we can begin with Harrison, then proceed to John. Yeah, uh, um, I don't know where to start on this one. It might need me to take uh, the questioner through a little bit of um, some, some views that he has meant that might be factually incorrect, because I think the position of the questioner is, for me, um, it stands on, you know, f uh, some factually in incorrect grounds, and therefore uh, the position becomes uh, it, it, the, the position of the questioner becomes a little bit shaky. Um, and and it's okay to say you don't you don't support the twill movement and you're not a twiller, but then let's clarify some facts. One, this idea that twillers have divided hegemonies. This is the first time I'm hearing it, and I would like to, to see the evidence because I've not seen the evidence that there are certain trailers who say the UN uh, Security Council system is okay, 
but the trade system is not okay. That I mean, I, I don't know because that's what I got to be the the concern that the trail has allowed certain hegemonies and then it is questioning others. I have not seen any evidence of this. And if the questioner has um, the evidence of this of any trailer, please kindly present it so that I see. It. But it's as far as I've read the movement and as far as my um, sort of uh, scope is concerned, I've not seen this. If anything, I have seen the opposite. The entire hegemonic system is questioned by Twilers from the very foundation of the UN. Now, and this is why I think uh, reading, for example, Anthony Engi is very important because he, he sort of does a very long historical sweep from the 16th century to the wars of uh, the American wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, just to show how Twilers from have been resisting, you know, how the, the system has been has been created to, to sort of subordinate and how resistant uh, has occurred. And therefore, the example that was given, for example, uh, the, 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 the wars, this is not even, uh, not, not even Twil, I mean, uh, very critical, uh, you know, sort of scholars have been fighting this from the word go. Uh, uh, Critical race theory, which is very close to Twill, has been speaking about, uh, about this since the, the, um, the Vietnam War. Uh, Richard Falk has spoken about this, uh, you know, uh, and uh, you can think about the, the Israel and Palestine problem. Uh, Twillers have, have, have spoken about this. Twillers have spoken about the ma against the mandate system uh, of, the, um, of the League of Nations. And then they have spoken about uh, the trustee, uh, trust, trusteeship system uh, in the um, in the UN. Trailers have spoken about uh, the hegemony of the UN Security Council, with some members having, uh, you know, a veto, while some members do not. So that's why I'm saying that that question is standing on weak ground, and that's the problem. If you cre if you if you uh, reach a position when you're standing on weak ground. Uh, you might be anti something that is not um, that you don't understand well, and this is this is me trying to sort of explain why there's a problem uh, with that question. Then the second part of the question was that uh, was comparative. It was very comparative. You know, we cannot do as well as um, whoever because they have been there for centuries, and so they have uh, had a better engagement with systems than us. I, I find that to be this in, infantilization argument that says no African countries are young, so that's why they're not doing well. African courts are young, that is why they're not uh, doing well. And I, I guess it's, it's always, it's always um, bad because uh, when especially young people, and most of us here are young uh, people are told, you know, you shouldn't speak because you're too young, you don't know uh, stuff. The, 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 the voice in the room just I mean, you're not able to present as diverse views, as dynamic views. And it's com comparativism of this sort is bad. It only leads to two things. And this is why I think the questioner is not a trailer. You can, with that kind of comparativism, you end up with only two things. We are not good because, okay, let's, let me put it this way. African countries or African courts, international courts cannot be like European courts because if they do well, they're only doing well because anyway, they are formed as like the European courts. They are formed in the mold of the European courts. Now, if they do bad, of course, what are you expecting? They are bad copies. So, 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 so you, end up, you end up shooting yourself in the feet anyway. I agree with the, with, the, with, the, with the question I hear because if you do that kind of comparativism, you cannot uh, see uh, the African system or the subaltern system or glo the global south for what it is and make an assessment in its own context within its own views, you will always end up saying you fall short. If you do well, you're doing well because anyway, you're, copied, uh, you're copying from another person. If you do bad, you're only doing bad because you're a bad copy. So in the end, you shoot yourself in the foot and I mean, you essentially, um, I'm advising against too, uh, uh, so much comparativism that then you end up with um, this view that the questioner ended up with. Thanks.
So uh, let, me, let me come in where Harrison has left. Uh, I find uh, it was Mr. Aaron Onyango. I, I, I said I'm not a trade carrying member, but I find that, that criticism too harsh and to some parts not very honest. I, I, I don't think your criticism to the trailers was, was really honest. And this is where I begin. When, when you talk about the hypocrisy, I don't, I, I don't think they, there is a hypocrisy. What I think Twail is suffering from is, 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 is com competing uh, solutions of, of how to achieve a, a balanced international law. And, and that is available in every school of thought of international law. Every school of thought of international law has, has a problem of competing interests. Sometimes you want to protect some interests, but at the same time, it's so paradoxical how you're going to protect those interests without hurting others. And, and this, is, this is uniform all through the, the, the board in international law. Look at, look at, look at NAIL and, and, and some of these issues. They also have, look at feminism and some of these issues. So I'll give you a good example. Hillary Charles what is asked by Fernandez, for example, he asked Fernandez, for example, how do we, how do we, how do we fight an illegit, assuming you are a, you are a, you are a, you are a feminist and a toiler, how do you fight a, 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 an illegitimate government? And then at the same time, you are telling that illegitimate institution, appoint more women for me to be in that institution. So they are always competing, competing interests in, in schools of thoughts of international law. And therefore you cannot really fault 12 because this is, this is just across the board. This is just across the board. You, they, you critique these bodies, but because they're still existing, we also want presence in them. And, and I find that fair. So I think that that criticism is, is a bit unfair. On mirroring of the global North, I think that's the wrong way of approaching how Twail thinks about this. Because essentially what Twail is saying is either we have an international law where we are all present equally or we have no international law. But telling Twailers to create, to, to continue being part of a system that they believe is oppressive and is not favoring their, their because they're young is not fair. What we need to do is that there, there cannot be international law of the global north and international law of the global south. We must have a unified system because there's no international law without us as players. Every part must be represented. That is the reality. The international law of today requires all parts. And that is why I'll give you a good example of why it requires all parts. Let's take the 2003 on, uh, on, 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 uh, on, on protection of, uh, on, 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 on protection of, of sovereign asset of states. We never even got quorum for it to come into force. But what happened on, on, on state immunity of, of sovereign, of, of, of sovereign property of states? We never got quorum to, to, to even bring the treaty into place. But because the entire world as a system, we agreed that this is how we think we should protect certain assets of states on their immunity, then that is fine and we're going to deal with that. And that is how you develop a unified system of international law where you don't find a, 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 a group of global north ratifying certain issues. And then, so and a good example, which I have faulted always is the Paris Agreement. I find it problematic. I find a lot of views of, 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 the, of African states not factored into and how we have viewed, because we, we have different interests in terms of international environmental law compared to Asia or America, for example. And these are not factored in. So when you have treaties that come into place, ratified by a few people, and we're supposed to assume it as international law, we're supposed to pop in, compared to a treaty like that of protection of sovereign states of assets, then we we have we we are really not being fair to toilers here, eh? and, and that one I I I don't agree as much as I'm a big critic of the of the system that it's not really a fair criticism of Twitter. Now I've seen one question on the on the on the chat that I wish to reply to before we go to, and this is the question that is asked on how to put OECD non OECD law firms into international dispute settlement, and, and I forgot to discuss this when I was discussing it because I think that the well. 
he makes a very good uh, analysis of this. I think that analysis should be deeper. Because that analysis for me is artificial in this sense. If you look at recent trends of international dispute settlement, many people who are participating as counsel at the International Court of Justice predominantly are coming from academia in the recent past. If you look at the last decade or two, a lot of them are coming from academia. Unless you are telling me they are coming from chambers, let's say a uh, brick court or or uh, 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 or or 3VB, for example. And, and these chambers are not traditionally law firms, for example. So I think the analysis is really needs to tell us how many people came from law firms and which are these law firms which are nano OCD. So for example, I know one of the law firms that is uh, nano OCD will be the Egyptian law firm that represented the African Union at the Mauritius Chagos uh, hearing for example. But if you look at the person that non-OECD uh, 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 law firm that was at the ICJ for the Mauritius case, the person they put is an off-cancer. Granted, he is African, but he sits in a European university in Europe. So there, there are there, that analysis to me was was not was not clearly because it didn't get down to the minute of because the problem for me is in the minute of details of how people are are, are coming into into this. It's not a problem of having non OECD law firms. Now this is my suggestion of what we're going. African countries, because I know it will be very hard for them to appoint councils from the law firms from their countries, should do this create very strong legal departments in the attorney general's office and legal departments of international law in the predominant universities in their states. So that, because they go to pick academics and I mean, we, we, we all know which, which law firms these are. I mean, there's no second guessing who they are. And, and I'll give credence to one, which actually is an OECD law firm, but I think they, they support a lot of Africans to be at the ICJ. And this is Foley Hogg. If you look at Foley Hogg and, and you look at the people who have been going for Foley Hogg cases, there is a good number of them who are African and, 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 and come from this continent. And the vice president of the, of the African Center of International, of, of, of international Law, the lady from Zimbabwe. Uh, whether it's Raymond Rangeva's son, Harry Rangeva, who is the partner for international law and the Foley Hall uh, in Paris. So we, we cannot really put a lot of, we cannot really say that it's because they're an OECD, then there's no uh, uh, Africans doing it. Foley Hall is a good exception that they are actually putting Africans on these cases. But we think we need to develop serious departments of international law that will attract international law talent in the attorney general's offices in these third world countries, but also use the academics in the international law uh, departments of schools in their countries for us to ensure that more people participate. But I don't think law firms is, is the best way of participating. I personally don't think it will happen like that. I think the easiest system is through the attorney general office and academics. Okay, great. I think um, we can move on to a question that I think directed to Harrison. It's that um, you propose the use of national courts as a mechanism for settling ISDs. And the question is that whether that doesn't violate the principles of natural justice. Yeah, um, Marie, I am a bit struggling with that one because uh, I wonder why we are saying that when we solve our dispute at the national courts, there's no national justice. Does the questioner mean that the parties are not going to be given a chance to present their case? Does the questioner mean that the judges in the national system are biased? Does the questioner, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a wonder for me. I, I am a bit, you know, uh, I'm a bit worried here because what what is the question? Question is is uh, the question also disparaging our national courts by saying uh, the, the national natural justice does not exist 
in um, in national courts. Now, as far as I'm aware, many courts in the global south, like any other courts in the world, espouse the principles of natural justice. Parties are given a chance on both sides to present their case. Who, to a large extent, is dispassionate and unbiased. There are challenges, of course, as there are challenges in many places in the world. But just saying with, with, with this, with the blanket statement that going to the national courts means no natural justice, is a, a form of me. Of, it's uh, in a way also perpetuating the view that African um, or um, African courts do not provide justice, that African courts are not, for lack of a better term, civilized enough to provide, you know, natural justice is a law, it's a, it's a law. You know, there are only two rules of natural justice, you know, uh, first year students, only two, you know, you can use the uh, Latin terms for them, but give both sides a chance to present their case and have an unbiased judge, only two. You mean we have, our courts are too low that we don't, we can't fulfill those two low levels of, actually, I, I don't know, you just think, for, for, I think that one is also a bit um, unfair for our, for our courts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Harrison, I think... unfortunately, I don't agree with you on this. <laughs> Harrison, I, I don't agree with you on this. Maybe the question is framed wrongly. Maybe it is framed wrongly. <laughs> because what we know is the rules of natural justice are something else. Maybe it is framed wrongly. But what the, maybe the person is asking the question is, is there belief that justice may not be done if we subject it to national courts? Well, thank you. Thank you, John, for clarifying this question for the questioner. Now it's a better question, but still not as, it's much better now. I mean, you have, you have raised the bar of the question now. It seems as if it's a higher question now. Maybe you will not get justice. Now it's no longer natural justice, guys. It's just justice, you know? And it's just justice. And my answer is denial of justice as an idea can come from any court in the world. Any. Not just not just global south courts, surely. Are you saying that denial of justice only happens in courts in the global south? I don't think so. I guess also uh, give, giving due respect um, to uh, the first question and John's question, uh, denial of justice. And I think uh, Jan Paulson has, has written the book on denial of justice. And you will see that the quest, uh, questions in, in investor state dispute resolution on denial of justice are, first of all, it's very difficult to prove denial of justice. Even when you're doing it, uh, you're saying uh, the domestic courts, even in the global south, have not provided it. But concerns of denial of justice come from both the global north and the global south. So saying that we should resolve our disputes at the domestic level does not is not equal to necessarily saying, then you get denial of justice. I don't think that, again, I don't think that is fair. And even you, John, know This one I can, I can say. <laughs> no, no, no. The issue here, Harrison, is not whether the, the denial of justice comes from the global north or global south. The issue is here is, why don't we have an ISDS system that governs the entire world such that no one is coming to complain that I was denied justice because I was subjected to the global North courts or to the global South courts. And Harrison, you know clearly that even Jan Paulson recognizes that issues of anti-arbitration injunctions, issues of public policy, states just wake up and through the national courts say, this is against our public policy. We're not going to deal with you. And public policy is not even universal. And public policy has become a big problem in investor state dispute settlement. So how do we deal with these issues if not dealing it from a universal court? And that's why I have been a big proponent of the Gabriel Kaufman Kohler proposed a multilateral investment court. Because if we're going to subject ourselves to national uh, courts, fair enough, but they mu it must be then a multi-tier dispute resolution process where if I don't think I've gotten justice at the national level, I will move to the multilateral court. But limit we're not limiting it to the global south alone, Harrison. There is problems in India. Indian courts are accused of, 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 of badly torturing investors in settlement, especially with the anti-arbitration injunctions, for example. 
Now, how do you deal with that then? Uh, of course, they come from a third world. And the same with Europe. You have countries like Belize, where you, if you choose to litigate some arbitration, you, you are even jailed in absentia. How do we deal with this? So it's not a global, no, it's, it's an issue whether at the very bottom of it, should we leave it for our national courts? Um, Marie, can I respond again? You can see that the level of the question is getting stronger and stronger as we go now. Now, we, it's even a, a much stronger question than it was when we began. And, and it's now true. Now we can discuss the fact that you can get denial of justice in any place in the world. So the question is, should we uh, allow them to go to the domestic court or do we create a multilateral court system? I think I, uh, many, many of, the, um, of the critics of ISDS will not have a problem with having a multilateral court. I don't think that uh, that would be uh, a, a problem per se because the, the, the ICJ is sort of existing and the WTO dispute resolution system, I mean, that is something that is acceptable. What, what is not acceptable in my view is to paint in broad strokes and just say, if you take the, the decisions nationally, you're going to have denial of justice. It, it doesn't um, go like that. Um, so I, uh, one, one last one before I, I turn it over to you, Marie. I think uh, uh, Christian has asked me here, how do national courts respond if a violation Okay, it's disappearing. If a violation of an investment protection, a treaty based or otherwise, um, is affected by statute, do they have jurisdiction to set aside the statute? Now, this I think is an, uh, a judicial review question in different countries. Uh, so I can say for a fact, in, um, in, in Kenya and in South Africa, the judicial review level is very high, that the courts have judicial review power to strike down legislation that is unconstitutional. Meaning that any statute that is not, is clear, if, you, if you say that, uh, and even not just statutes, but also executive action. So this is the you know, origin of uh, the Marbury v. Madison uh, power. That exists in both countries and has been exercised for both executive and, um, and uh, legislation. And I know that there are many people here from different parts of Africa who can also uh, say, you know, what powers the courts have at the domestic level. I, I would be willing to then go to that discussion of if the court does not have this power, should we consider it strong enough to hear some of these cases? And again, that will be even a higher level of questioning of how the system works. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marie, for the indulgence. It's all right. Thank you. Um, actually, before we move on from that issue, there are two questions that have arisen from your discussion. So I'm actually going to invite Joe Kahumbu to ask. Now, I don't know whether it's his or her question. The name is really not revealing, but yeah, Joe um, can ask that question. Which, or her question then <laughs> um, from the chat. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yes, my question is more or less um, linked to what Mr. Nyanje said regarding public policy, where he mentioned that public policy can be different things to many different countries. And so how can this be resolved or dealt with at a forum that is universalized, where the forum considers public policy to be X, whereas a global South country would consider public policy to be a matter of something else? So how can this be, um, what's the word, put together? and considered as one thing where a country in the global north and the global south can agree on what exactly public policy entails. So what is happening, what is happening around the world is there is almost a codification of, of public policy. But I find it problematic uh, because I, I think public policy to different people Means, means means a lot of different people, uh, even a lot of different things. And, and also standards of public policy are different from one to another, depending on the issue in question. Now, can we codify uh, public policy? I think we can try. And, and how we can try to do it is, you see how we have done in, in commercial arbitration where you, you, 
you you get questions of law and you are and you are told that you're not going to apply any law of any country but you will apply lex mercatoria for example and so we have to get like a lex public principles of how we're going to, to, to deal with, with general issues. But then for me, public principles are issues of fact. They're not issues of law for me. They're, they're issue, they're public policy is an issue of fact for me. It's not an issue of law per se. I don't find it an issue of law most of the time. For me, it's an issue of fact and tribunals can do it on a case to case basis. At, uh, at, at an international level. So for me, I don't find it a problem. If we can develop, and, and there has been attempts of, of, of developing public, a, uni, a unified code of public policy, especially in commercial arbitration, like how you'd have Lex Mercatoria, I don't find it very useful. For me, I, I think public policy is an issue of fact and tribunals can deal with it on a case-to-case -case basis, whether it's at a multilateral court level or at, the current investor state dispute settlement method. So for me, that's not a big problem. So John, I want to ask you a small question on public policy. You see, uh, in the EU, uh, on the SEALS case, the EU told us that their public policy is much towards that killing SEALS is not okay in the EU. And there are big problems with this because some countries, even in the EU, were, were of the view that they did, they were not sure whether this is against their, 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 their public policy. Uh, I, I wonder how you can have a global public policy. It's just something that I cannot fathom because just in Kenya, for example, what really would constitute public policy? If you go to Rwanda and ask two different people on the street, They'll tell you, I mean, what you think is public policy, the next person does not think is public policy. And I, that, I, that's why I think the, the, you know, the, the, the English courts told us it's the unruly horse. How do you, if national systems have been unable to come up with a, 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 a position on public policy, I wonder how the, any global court is going to come up with it and whether that is really going to solve the problem that we are having here. Whether the, I mean, let everyone decide what the public policy is and let's try to reconcile where differences arise. That's my view. And I agree with you, Harrison, totally. I, I, I honestly agree with you. I agree with you to that extent. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I personally have a problem with people in commercial arbitration who pretend there can be a public policy. Uh, I, I say that. I have a problem with that. Because I, even, even live along the sea, tuna dolphin, right? Or whaling in Antarctica. Uh, what, what the U.S. thinks how tuna should be caught or how Australia thinks whaling in, in Japan is, is a problem is it, different because I actually had an international player who's telling me whaling in Japan is considered, people don't even eat whale meat. They consider it an act of culture and history and they do it just for the privilege and saying, I don't want any other country telling me what to do. So I know it's hard to create public policy. And that is why I think public policy should be dealt on a case-to-case -case basis. That is my view. On a case-to-case -case basis, that is fine. Um, John, I you say that it should be on a case-to-case -case basis, actually. I think there's a question from Alpha. Um, I think he should um, ask himself rather than I reading the question for him, if he's available. Um, Alpha? Mwalimu, how are you, sir? Uh, I'm very well. Uh, yeah, so, Bwana, Bwana John, Bwana, let me, let me just ask you here. Yeah? So, uh, from your statement, umesema um, ati public... Alpha, uh, many, many people in the forum don't understand Swahili. We want to put it in English. All right, all right. I have some. Let, let, me, let me just speak English. Sasa, um, good sir, you said ati... Um, arbitration is at the mercy of public policy but um, i'm just asking so would you just uh, yeah. say that um, that arbitration in the uh, the courts will just rule for public policy uh, at the expense of arbitration man uh, so this is this is the thing i think you, you i think you didn't understand me clearly okay this is what I said. <laughs> there are two parallel systems here. There is arbitration that is there today under ISDS. 
And there is a national system that Harrison has always pushed forward to in the event that we don't get a good alternative of the ISDS. What I am saying is this, investors will be at the mercy of national courts, whether in the global north or the global south. Now we must be very honest here that judiciaries, I, 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 I am really worried saying this statement, Many judiciaries in, in, in the third world are not free and independent. I'm not saying those in the global north are. I'm not saying that. But there is enough scholarship, including from third world members themselves, that some of these things are not in the in and are not are not are not are not are not free and fair. Let me give you a good example. Today, if the Italian investors in Kimware are all dumb cases of Kenya. What to take that arbitration to a judicial body of Kenya to determine it. And the amount of pressure that the judiciary of Kenya is at the moment, that the executive of Kenya is at the moment putting on the judiciary of Kenya. What are the likely chances that those investors will get justice? What are the likely chances? Assume, let's, let's assume for arguendo purposes that corruption is not an issue. What are the chances that they will get justice? Because here there is a problem of perception. And, 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 and look, even trailers themselves, the problem they have with the current ISDS system, and I have written this and Harrison has put a very good response to it. There is a problem of perception. Harrison says it's not purely per perception, these are realities. And I, and I agree to some parts, there are some of them are realities, but there's a problem of perception. And we cannot move from one distracted, distrusted system to another distrusted system. We must create a, then what are we doing? If we are moving from one system that is distrusted at the moment by third world states, then we are moving to another system that is now be distrusted by the investors. We, we have not healed anything. So then you didn't get me clearly there. That is my issue. I have no issue with public policy at all. If, for example, the public policy in, in, in Kenya, which is a Muslim country for agenda purposes, is, is that pork, pork cannot be, 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 be sold here and officials of, of an investment company are sneaking in pork and their company is expropriated, so be it. You see, that is a public policy issue. So be it, it's correct. But that's not my issue. My issue is a distrust of the system. Um, sorry, I dropped off the call a bit. Michael, was Dan, or was John Dan? Yes, was yeah. Done. Was uh, done. Okay. So sorry about that. I believe Nicola had a question and a comment on that, on the discussion that was ongoing. So I think I should let her ask the question. Um, thank you so much. I think Joe already expressed my point, uh, but it was just to say that um, there has been no nothing to give us faith in international um, court tribunals. And almost every example we have has, has demonstrated not only an unwillingness to understand the local context and why a specific regulatory choice would be justified in the local context, but also every example has shown just how, um, pre just how prevalent the old colonial relics of international investment law still are in the way that it prioritizes the needs of the investor over the needs of the host state um, of the way that communities have so little input, and if they do, it's um, you know it's a kind of a silent, silent submission. And so, um, in terms of, so I just so I understand your concern about domestic courts, but it, but I just think there's been no evidence that that there could be an unbiased. Um, it's, it's 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 in the fabric of international investment law and international arbitration. Uh, a colonial um, operation, a colon colonial uh, prioritization of corporate power. And I don't think, um, I just don't think you've justified why a multilateral court could, could hold any prospect of, um, 
of get, gaining, gaining faith. Thank you. So, so Nicola, Nicola, this is this is my response. I didn't speak much of it, but if one of the reasons I think the multilateral court will work is this: uh, depending with how we create the multilateral court, it might have confidence in both states and investors because we must we must start thinking that this is not a court that will depend on 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 on. On, on confidence from states alone. I think for me, that's, that's, just not, that's just the wrong way. It must have confidence of both states and investors. Now look at this. Uh, Anthea Roberts says, states are not that stupid. If they're told to pick 21 uh, judges of that court, they're not going to only pick pro-state or pro-investor uh, judges. States have, this is a double-edged sword. States have to protect their investors, but states have to protect their interests as states as well. And that multilateral court will have divergent members of the tribunals, because where's the distrust coming from? The current ISDS system has one weakness. You can easily tell a person by the state or the investor how they're going to rule. It is that simple. You don't need you 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 don't need to read a lot of investment law to know that if Bridget Stan is appointed, she's always going to favor a state. You, you don't need a lot a, a lot to know about that. But when this multilateral court comes into place, it's not going to have only Bridget Stans. It's also going to have people who are like Zachary Douglas's, for example, who favor uh, uh, investors. And and so you you're not going to 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 think. To, to, to think that states will will just naturally just put people who are, who are going to protect their investment because they come from the global north and they have, because the states have started learning these lessons thoroughly. And a good example of how they've learned this is America through the NAFTA. America, when the NAFTA dispute settlement began, America thought it was going to be in the charm offensive. And then soon they discovered that they're also subject to a lot of cases coming from Mexico and Canada. And that's why they didn't like that system anymore. It's because they thought the system is gonna be a favoritism system towards the investors. And I think states have learned that lesson. Unless you tell me states are not learning these lessons and the global North states will still insist on having members of that body being pro-investor, which I don't think states will do that. States are receiving a lot of suing. The only state that is not being sued despite a lot of suing is Switzerland. And it doesn't have that much influence in ISDS in EU in terms of voting compared to the other members. I think the other states which are receiving cases like Germany, like France, will have a lot of push of having a balance of arbitrators who are both pro-investor and pro-state. So I, I don't think this for me is, is, is something that the multilateral court will not solve. But at the domestic level, how are we going to be assured of this? that every interest is going to be covered. For me, this is my worry. How are states going to give us confidence? Because just from the structures of it, how it's going to happen. And then we have to come up with a good system of picking those members of, of the multilateral court. Now, at the only problem, at least I would agree with you that it's, it's not giving confidence, is the funding of the multilateral court. That one there will have a big problem. Because if we end up with a with a WTO sort of thing where the US is funding half of it, then that's a problem. But if states are going to fund it each equally, then that problem will be solved. Whether that's possible, funding for me is the problem. Who, who is going to be funding the court? For me, that's the problem. And how much influence are they going to be having from funding? But picking of people or, or, or how they're going to come to the court, for me, this is not a problem at all. Okay, thank you so much, John. Um, I think we are almost concluding. We're supposed to conclude at 7 p.m. So I'll take two last questions. There were two hands raised uh, for a bit. Um, so we'll take Michael's first and then Jean-Luc, and then we'll conclude. Um, kindly make it brief because I think we are, we've run out of time. Yeah. 
Thank you, Marie. Uh, I'm unable to, to um, back a counter. Let me just, I want to ask Harrison. Uh, 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 so I had this question of, uh, is there seem to be class formation in the movement, uh, in the child movement. There seems to be a fourth world in the third world. <laughs> and when I think when South Africa, if we talk about participation, international law, advancing global South perspective, so that we can reform, we can contribute to international law. Still, the way South Africa, all the big five economies, the way the interest they would advance in terms of international economic law, or Nigeria, or any other country, Morocco would advance, would totally be different from Rwanda. So this class structure seems to be being formed in the movement, and we seem to not take portion of it, or rather maybe there is some uh, effort being you know, lodged towards that. But the appreciation of different categories that are in the movement, uh, what South Africa might be negotiating in the international line, it might not be the same with Rwanda. How do you be able to incorporate within a third world movement or within a third world uh, you know, aspect that seem to be really static, but as we go along, we leaving some countries behind, like Burundi, which probably their interest economically would not be, you know, much South Africans, or even the subjugation, the economic subjugation we keep talking about, might not, is really hitting different, you know, across the continents. How do you talk about the Harrison? Yes, I think that's an important question uh, that uh, we all must um, contend with. But the response is that if the stronger countries in Africa expose imperialistic tendencies against, say, other African countries, then that's imperialism. You know, trailers will call it as it is. That is why recently you have seen with the the, foray in, uh, the forays that China is having in Africa, we are saying that they're displaying the same tendencies of imperialism that uh, the global North countries have done in Africa for a long time. So if South Africa does the same, if Nigeria does the same, if Rwanda does the same against other countries, it is still going to be called out. And I think trailers will be the first ones to call out this kind of um, imperialistic tendencies. And it's not new. I mean, it's not, it's not as if twi the Twill movement has not been calling out, you know, South-South imperialisms. And uh, from a colonial point, you know that we have had South-South colonialisms. Uh, you know, for example, Eritrea and Ethiopia is a good example. And Twill uh, scholars have called that out. And you know about uh, Western Sahara and Morocco, and and this has uh, has been there since the you know southern um, west cases in the ICJ. So I don't uh, I I see that you know uh, part of your your concern is also can we have a, a singular African voice for the states? I think it's a difficult one. Maybe not. Uh, are twelve scholars saying that you necessarily need that? not in all cases. In some cases, I think there's need uh, for African countries to speak in one voice. I mean, you will see the way African, the AU spoke in the Chagos uh, case in one voice. You know, it would have been really bad if any African country, if, if, if they said, uh, went to the ICJ and said, uh, we don't support uh, Mauritius in this claim. So there are certain concerns uh, and th that you can see, you can say, oh, that is an extreme one because it's colonialism, you're talking about trade issues. It becomes, uh, if you introduce a new issue, it becomes more difficult. If you introduce, so um, we need to uh, look at this on a case by case basis and see what specific issue are we talking about? Can African countries speak in one voice on that? Maybe yes, maybe not. So for ISDs, for example, you have seen South Africa is taking a very different view, say, from Tanzania. And, and there are certain scholars uh, are saying, uh, 12 scholars are saying the Tanzanian way is the right way. Others are saying, no, the South African way is the right way. Um, 
And it doesn't have to be one uh, specific way. As long as we are trying to create a system that is going to benefit, especially the peoples of the global south, the, the, the poor peoples of the global south, the, the farmers who are in these uh, 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 villages trying to uh, act a living, the people who are trying to run away from extreme poverty, the miners in South Africa, I saw Nicola speak about them. I mean, if, if we keep our focus on them, uh, people who some of these issues affect, the people who are going to face land grabs, their land is going to go away, and not the African elite. The African uh, mid-level elite and high-level elite, we are going to change this. Unfortunately, all of us here, especially because we are lawyers and we are going to become to be part of the practice, you most of us will most probably land on being some kind or some form of elite. So we also must fight our own elitism from within. Accepting that we are uh, we, we, we are within the elite, maybe not the high level elite. You are not making the same. You are not sitting at the same table with the ministers and the presidents and the big uh, multilateral companies and making decisions that are changing the country. But uh, you are also not sitting um, uh, in uh, at the same level as the villages who want to see how the agriculture is going to be beneficial for them. The, peop the women who are working in EPZs and all, uh, those are the people we should also be very much concerned about when we speak about this. So when we keep the discussion at the South Africa versus Rwanda versus Nigeria, uh, what we forget is that the farmer in Nigeria is facing very similar challenging challenges to the miner in South Africa, and maybe their needs might align but they're not able to present their view on the table together. And maybe those are the people and the concerns that might be more important to focus on and see how their voices can be uh, brought to the table. The indigenous communities, for example, I mean, it's, it, can, it, it, it is much more beneficial for them than at the state level interest, which are mainly controlled by high level elites who are in themselves protecting their own transnational capital storing it in the West, in Switzerland and in the big banks, and not uh, sometimes concerned with the uh, concern of the people at the bottom billion, as Prof uh, Professor Gedi will call them. Thanks. I, I, I've tried. It's a difficult question, Mike. Uh, Marie, uh, before we, we conclude, I think there are some important questions that we ought not to go without answering them. So one I've seen is this one that I was actually posted earlier by uh, Peter Kariuki on issues of acta jure imperi and acta jure gestionis. Now, this question is very personal to me because and that is why I want to, to say about it. Last year I had a PCA case, investor state, where uh, I'm representing the investor and this investor uh, supplied items to the military of a country that was fighting a rebel group. And uh, uh, cut the story short, to cut the, the story short, all of you who know, I mean, why this actor Euro Imperial and actor Euro Gestionis is rising, is that at the tribunal, these people are saying, we want you to determine whether those acts done by the Ministry of Defense in taking those contractual items are acta jure imperi or acta jure gestionis, which subsequently lead to whether we can enforce against that state. This is an area that I think Twail must really take serious in development of international law. There is a lot of hypocrisy from our states in application of rules that have been set down by the ILC in terms of issues of trade and investment, especially this area of Acta Jure Imperi, Acta Jure Gestionis, and state immunity. Because essentially, if you supplied weapons to an activity that is not commercial, the argument will thus then be that you cannot force that issue into a tribunal and subsequently into enforcing against that government. Now, this is the problem I have with this argument. The problem I have with this argument is that our states have, have taken a habit 
of taking the same international law that they say is oppressive and then use it against investors when there is an agreed rule of how we are going to handle this dispute. Listen, any government that pens itself and says we are entering into a commercial agreement and waiving jurisdiction, regardless of whether those goods were being supplied to a military or anything, because the argument is that those goods are being used for the purposes of protection of the, board, of, the, of the borders of a state and therefore will not fall on the ampit of commercial transactions of a company. But then what do you expect of telling investors that they bring to you goods and then they have no recourse after you are unable to pay them for them? So these are areas that we must start critiquing our governments that even as we develop international law, we must be able to deal with this. And the problem of this is created by the International Tribunal of Law of the Sea in uh, ARA Libertad, Argentina versus Ghana, when they were trying to enforce uh, the, the, the award against when the Argentinian president went with the ship in, in, into Ghana. This is, this is the kind of international law that we must start challenging and start asking our ourselves question because tomorrow our investors will go to other states whether here between ourselves as third world or because in this case it's actually an investor from a third world state who was supplying weapons to, uh, to weapons and fuel to uh, 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 a country of the third world and this country of the third world is using the same type of rules to try and con out investors so there is a problem of application of these rules, and I'm happy that somebody asked about these issues of Acta Iure Imperi and Acta Iure Gestionis. Now, unfortunately, I cannot tell you how the tribunal has ruled because we don't have the award. We expect the award next month. Uh, but I, I hope that arbitrate, that tribunal goes into in-depth of thinking of these issues of, of application of, of some of these rules. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, we have to pause here. Um, there, are, there are a lot more questions in the chat and I see hands that were still raised, but you can take those um, in the next lecture, the 10th lecture, or if anyone wants, they can send it to the email. Um, apart from that, I think we can continue the discussion out, out of this room actually, or even in the next lecture. And I think one question that was asked privately, which we can begin with is that whether twill just um, raises the problem or it actually offers a way forward and actual solutions to the problems that we are seeing. Um, so I think we can begin there. But other than that, I want to thank everyone who attended. I, I see some already left, but then I want to thank them as well as Harrison and John for the lively discussion. As I said, it was very thought provoking and I hope we can continue it. But other than that, um, I think we, I pray that we all stay well and yeah, have a lovely day or evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Yeah, I don't know if Michael wants to add anything, but to Harrison and John, thank you. Thank you, Marie, for, I also thank uh, and Chico for his, you know, as always, uh, you know, and at the same time, that was great. I think everyone's really, really happy and I think it somehow helps us understand, uh, you know, what well is basically, and then everyone can develop their answers from here, try to inquire more. I think you can always talk to Harrison too, he's, he's very, very responsive when it comes to well, uh, and John, I guess, so, so let's, let's keep reading. Bye. <laughs>